Hi, and welcome to the Brookdale Writers Series here at Brookdale Community College. My name is Suzanne Parker, and I'm on the English faculty here at Brookdale College, and I will be your host. I'm here today talking with Laura McCullough, who's also on the English faculty and who is the chair of the very successful Visiting Writers series. Um, Laura is a poet, and her first collection of poetry called The Dancing Bear was just published by One Book Press. So welcome, Laura. Nice to have you on the show. Hi. Um, I thought I'd start off by talking a little bit about the book and how it's been received, and then I thought maybe you would share a poem for us. Okay, here you go. Um, what struck me about the book was its generosity of spirit. This seems to be written by a poet who just, who loves life and who loves life for warts and all. Um, it seems to me to be a book that synthesizes um, kind of an acute honesty with a great deal of playfulness. And for me, that's why I enjoyed the book so much. Mm. Um, I know that critics have called the book a lovely collection. They've also said, in the words of Stephen Dunn, the Pulitzer Prize-winning poet, that this is a book that probes and clarifies where the elevated and mundane are treated with equal curiosity and verve. And New Jersey poet B.J. Ward has called it a fantastic first book. So congratulations on it. Thank you. Um, is there a poem you'd like to read to start us off? Um, yeah, I can read one that'll give um, uh, some flavor of, of what the book is. Although um, the, the title poem, which I'm not going to read, The Dancing Bear, is a meditation on the poet Lorca mm -hmm. uh, and his concept of the duende, the demon that artists and writers and um, thinkers battle within themselves, sometimes successfully, sometimes not so successfully, but that it, it is what drives them to write, and I think all the poems in the book in some way try to speak to the demon in some mm. fashion. I, I don't know if this one quite does, M maybe you'll tell me. It's called Fish Tank in the Hospital Lobby. When I dipped my finger in, they came quickly, though I can't imagine they were hungry, so huge they were, well fed for certain, but I pulled away afraid. I stuck my whole hand in, and one gripped my pinky. As I yanked back, the sound in the air was like a kiss breaking the surface between two worlds, and I was still afraid. Later, the phlebotomist said, I don't want the needle to go all stupid on me, and I had to agree. We wouldn't want that. So he didn't use the small needle. His hands were large, meaty, soft skeins of tight yarn balled together, so his fingers splayed like an accordion player's. Around us, music floated, oil on the surface of the day, which had only just begun. Wonderful. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. It's a great poem. You, now, you talked about demons, was it? Yeah, the daemon. Sorry. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah? When you, when you put this, this book together, and I know this is a difficult question, but how would you describe your work in this book? Is there an overall arc, some poetic mm -hmm. concerns or themes that crop up? Yeah. Um, I actually have two other manuscripts, um, one done and one that I'm completing, and each one does deal with a different obsession. Mm -hmm. um, this one, I think, was trying to, to deal with issues of media, um, issues of the public versus the private, um, and tried to play with the idea of the, the daemon. I use it as, as a metaphor for, uh, of the dancing bear. Um, the dancing bear in the circus is something we all either really did or imagine going to as a child. Um, something frivolous, something playful, but yet a bear could kill you. And to really train bears or any kind of animal to do that sort of thing, you have, you have to do a lot of really ugly things. Um, to train animals, you um, certainly in earlier times, not so much anymore, you would starve them, you would um, harm mm. them, you would have to break their spirit. And so the dancing bear is both an ugly image and, and a playful one. And that's what I was trying to uh, work with in all of the poems. Throughout the whole manuscript? I, I think so. The juxtaposition between the sacred and the mundane, the ugly and the beautiful, the, the playful and the dangerous. Hmm. Now, you mentioned Lorca, and I noticed as I looked through the book that a number of these poems refer to um, 
other artists. You've got mm -hmm. Gardner in here. You've got the poet James Tate. Yeah. You've got um, Albert Einstein in here <laughs> as well, in yeah. two back-to-back -back poems. Yeah. And I wondered, you know, do you pull your inspiration then from things you read or from these other artists? Um, I'm definitely very aware of artists, writers, thinkers, painters, sculptors as all being people who are trying to pierce the veil of this existence to tap into something beyond what our daily human experience allows us. And in that sense, I, I, I think that there's a, I don't want to say brethren or a brotherhood, um, but, but there are there are hosts of people all through time who have tried to do that. and and they all live outside of time. They all are, especially today where we have access to so much that's come before us, there are our ancestors, whoever is co contemporary, um, whoever the contemporary writers are, they have ancestors, they have progenitors, and I think you need to know who's come before you and what thinking they've done, what struggles they've had, where they've tried to go in their imagining. Um, so I'm very aware that they're standing behind me and, and, and um, sometimes provoking me. So I have to ask, who are they for you? Um, well, certainly the uh, ones that you mentioned that are in the book, mm -hmm. um, uh, Einstein, uh, James Tate, uh, um, Lorca, but there are other very important influences, um, older and some contemporary. Um, believe it or not, I think D.H. Lawrence. Um, mm -hmm. Most literary people would, of course, think of him in terms of his prose, but he, the bald honesty of his, his poetry was important to me. Yeats, um, Stephen Dunn has been an, an extremely important influence to me, the Pulitzer Prize winning mm -hmm. poet who, who's really at the, still at the top of his game. Um, uh, lots of other contemporary people. Now what was it about Einstein? <laughs> you know, one of the <laughs> things I liked about Einstein, and you know that I have an interest in science and the arts, mm -hmm. um, was that he recognize that even in the most logical thing there was a mystery. You know, I love the concept of an elegant solution. I, I love the idea that that scientists are doing very much the same thing poets are doing, trying to imagine beyond what we know into what we don't know. And um, he's actually lately become somewhat of a controversial figure in relation to uh, his spouse and partner who, who may very well have had uh, much more to do with the work his life's work than was recognized earlier, but um, he was a playful thinker and um, you know someone who didn't who didn't really go with the mainstream, but yet and yet was willing to take a great deal of risk in his in his thinking. You know, we've moved beyond Einstein in a lot of ways, but he was still an interesting character. See, I find it interesting that you, you like the idea of his playfulness. Because that's what I love about some of the poems in The Dancing Bear, mm. is the, the humor and the playfulness in the voices. If I can read a few just beginnings and openings as, as an example. In the Egg Harbor City Elementary School, which is the title of the poem, you start out, a fighter plane accidentally let loose a barrage of bullets. But the school was closed, luckily, for the teachers' convention. Right. It's a very dark poem, yeah, however, is, by the end. The yeah. tone of it. And then, yeah. like in Weather Terrorism, you've mm -hmm. got a chimpanzee raised by humans bit the finger off a visitor and had to be sent to a zoo. And mm -hmm. even in uh, Mia Culpa Meta, okay, so I was trying not to write another poem about guilt. And then you go mm -hmm. on to write a poem about writing a poem about guilt. <laughs> I find that there's a, a wonderful playfulness in mm -hmm. your work whilst addressing some very serious themes and subjects. Is that something you strive for? Is this a voice that you're aware of? And you're like, I'm gonna write a playful poem today. Yeah. Um, you know, writing, I think, for me at least, is about discovering what my mind thinks in relation to other minds. And so I'm in a process of figuring out what I know and who I am in the process of writing. So I'd like to claim more metacognition than you're giving me credit for. Um, I think there are some effects that I'm, uh, some craft effects that hopefully I'm being in charge of, but I would leave it to the critics to decide the answer <laughs> to your question, if I, if I get any critics. Well, I'm lucky enough to get critics. <laughs> I, lo I love the playfulness in it. At the same time, in those, for example, in the three poems, Starts, that I just read, um, 
you drop us sort of right into a scene, right into the action of it. And mm -hmm. I know when Billy Collins was here earlier being interviewed for the Visiting Writers series, he had said that he has a Billy Collins, you know, quote unquote, speaker. Mm -hmm. And this is the man who doesn't really have a job, lounges around all day writing poems and tinkering on the piano. Oh and God. he's like, it's a part of me, the part of me that yeah. has a lot of leisure time. Mm -hmm. um, but that this is sort of the constructed voice of his poems. Right. That he'd, and he'd been developing the character of Billy Cal Collins, yeah. The poet. Mm -hmm. okay. And again, I see, because I also know you, we work together, you're a friend, mm -hmm. and there's, there's a heightened, I think, sense of awareness and playfulness in these poems, and also a, a sense of dropping us right in a lot of times. Like in these three poems, bam, we're right into the scene. Mm -hmm. Is that something you're aware of when you write a poem, that I want to write about this, I'm going to start here? Um, well, I, I would answer that in two ways. One is that I am conscious in the revision process of trying to mm -hmm. eliminate as much superfluous on-ramping as mm -hmm. possible to get to whatever the hot the hot moment is. In now, by on-ramping, you mean uh, the the information that during first drafts one is 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 going through to find the concern of the poem, to find out what the obsession. Uh, of that particular poem, the golden thread that you're then going to try to pull through the poem, mm -hmm. trying to find out what that is, um, sometimes takes a while. Mm -hmm. um, on the other hand, I don't think uh, that I have yet achieved what anyone would call um, the character of Laura McCullough. Uh, I hope, hope a couple books from now that maybe we can say that. But what is your writing process? Are you uh, up at 5 a.m., put in two hours, and then come teach at Brookdale <laughs> kind of writer? <laughs> well. I have a very full life. Um, I do teach full time at Brookdale. I love teaching at Brookdale, and if I can give a plug, it is the best community college <laughs> in the state of New Jersey. And I really mean that. And I'm honored to be here. It's a it's an exciting uh, campus. It's, it's an exciting time. Uh, we really are trying to offer um, our community college students as close to a four year. Uh, college experience as possible. Mm -hmm. So that does mean a lot of us are trying to do things way outside of the classroom. I know with the Visiting Writer Series, you're part of that as well. Right. And the, actually, I think when we, because we have to take a break, when we mm -hmm. come back from break, I'd love to ask you about the Visiting Writer Series okay. and what's going on with that um, coming up in the rest of the semester. So we'll take a break and we'll be back with Laura McCullough and the Brookdale Writing Series. I was hanging out with some people. Now I realize I shouldn't have. The work was so hard. It was just going fast, fast, fast. I got kicked out of school and nobody cared about me, so I don't care. I sort of got messed up into gangs and other stuff. School was very difficult. I was expelled from school. I mean, the one person who really got me to go back into school was my friend Kevin. At my friend's graduation, I'm going to be the loudest one there. Because if you don't have anybody while you're in school, then there's not really a way to get through it. You wouldn't treat a crash test dummy like a child. So why treat a child like a crash test dummy? If they're under four foot nine, they need a booster seat. Learn more at boosterseat.gov. Hi, and welcome back to the Brookdale Writers Series. My name is Suzanne Parker, and I'm here with Laura McCullough my colleague and fellow teacher here at Brookdale Community College and the author of the new poetry collection called The Dancing Bear. So welcome back after break. Um, before break, we were talking about the idea of your writing process and waking up at the crack of dawn and yeah, never. kicking out the poems. <laughs> never wake up at the crack of dawn if I can help it, <laughs> other than when my, my baby wakes me. I have a very full life. I, I, I teach full time. Um, 
my husband teaches full time here at Brookdale as well. We have three teenage sons. I have an adopted two year old daughter and, a, and another adopted baby on the way. I write in the interstices of my life. I write in the moments in between everything. I'm, I'm a monument to you can find the time if you <laughs> really want to. And in fact, having such a full life is part of what, what um, I think drives me to write. I, I, I have so much that I have to do for folks outside of me um, that to have an interior life, I must, I must make time for it to be allowed to exist. Well, I know that Lucille Clifton has said that with all of her children, and she came to writing later, that she would write during the baby's nap time. Sure. And that's why she has short poems. <laughs> She's like, because the baby would wake up early. Well, you know, that's really one of the reasons that I, w I am writing poetry. But I, I'm, uh, and I do have um, two other completed manuscripts, but now I'm writing a novel. And it is incredibly difficult to write a novel in, you know, f 10 minutes here, half hour there, an hour here. It's very, very difficult. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you when it's done, if it actually works <laughs> or if it's going to feel like... Well, I know like that this. you went to Goddard and you got your mm -hmm. MFA, but your MFA was actually in fiction. In fiction, yeah. But you're published now in poetry, yeah. and now you're writing a novel. Yeah. So you... Is something is there something that switched over in you and has switched back, or um, the desire to write both always existed? The I don't I I've written or and read since as long as I can remember, and I don't see them as separate. Um, I don't think you can be a writer without being a reader, and and, and they're very connected in my mind. And so it's been my entire life, and um, I, I'm not well read, but widely read, and so. Mm -hmm. I read all kinds of things, and so I would want to write all kinds of things. What it, what has been interesting is how um, studying in depth the craft of fiction has informed my poetry. And I think a lot of people would say there's there's a strong narrative uh, vein in, in my poetry. But poetry now that I'm coming back to fiction has clearly affected my prose, and I think they can inform each other. I don't like you know the camps of oh, poets shouldn't talk to fiction writers and <laughs> fiction writers shouldn't talk to poets. I really think they can inform each other. Well, I know that you also, you chair and run the Visiting Writer Series here mm -hmm. at Brookdale, who has brought, you know, Mark Doty, Lee Young Lee, Billy Collins, the former poet laureate, these incredible authors. Mm -hmm. um, and those are all poets, but incredible fiction writers as well. Mm -hmm. um, just wondering what's going on with that, and how, how is the, the person who runs this, which is an incredible amount of work, um, how does that influence your writing at all? Um, I don't see it as influencing my writing um, because probably the effect of those writers is on the page for me. Mm -hmm. um, it does greatly affect my teaching and my experience um, as a faculty member here. What's been very important to me is having students meet the writers. Mm -hmm. I went to Stockton as an undergraduate and went for so many years to the visiting writer series there that Stephen Dunn ran. Went to so many dinners with those writers, often um, receptions afterwards, and they gave me a vision for my life. And what I'm hoping is that I'm giving that back to students here um, through the English Club, through the visiting writer series. You're um, co-director of the Brookdale Spring Writers Conference mm -hmm. that's coming up again. It'll be the second annual one. I, I think that the fact that we can offer that and develop a community of writers mm -hmm. here, frankly, not develop, tap into the community of writers yeah. that was here that didn't know they were here, um, that's what matters to me. I love having students. We've had high school students um, from uh, Red Bank, local teen arts students, um, come to dinner with the writers. And then they get to just talk to them <coughs> and see them as people who are accessible. Mm -hmm. And then it gives them a vision for potentially what their lives could be that they might not have had beforehand. Yeah. Well, I know as the co-director for the Spring Writers Conference that you're there as a reader, you're there as a panelist as well, and we're very excited about that. Um, but you've also been a part of other conferences as well, and you're, you seem to be creating a community, a, a writing center here that um, people can contact one another and, and, and share work. Do you find that that's important to you as a writer, having a community? Uh, absolutely. Yeah. Um, and in a way, it's like the real life manifestation of the one I mentioned earlier about knowing all, who your yeah. progenitors are, who your ancestors are as writers and thinkers. You can't, many times writers and artists work in a vacuum, but when you can have other writers, artists, thinkers, musicians, all, all of the folk who are trying to work in, in the creative arts, they can feed off of each other, they can inspire mm -hmm. each other. And um, it's one of the joys of having colleagues as well that I had not anticipated before I was at Brookdale. Do you have 
with your own work, when you're writing poems or a manuscript, do you have a group of readers who, you know, you kind of send work to or who support you in some way? Um, I do have some first readers. Um, my husband, Michael Brook, um, who is a faculty here but also is a publishing poet. He hasn't in a little while because he's working on his PhD at uh, the University of Essex in the UK. Um, he's certainly a first reader and, and a, a brutal, honest first reader. <laughs> Um, we've tried to have some of that here, but believe it or not, my students teach me so much, not directly in response to my poems, but in terms of thinking about craft. Um, I have great, great poetry students here at Brookdale. Mm. Um, uh, Stephen Dunn reads my poems still. Um, he's very brutal. I'll, I'll hope before I die to get one that he'll be happy with. <laughs> um, but beyond that, it's very hard to have readers, and anybody who writes knows this, because it, it really is a great deal of work to respond yeah. to people's writing and, and to do it in a constructive way that assists them to break through their own habits or, or break through their, to, to more, um, more underlying concerns, mm. to discover what the metaphors that keep coming up in your own work are and figure out how to explode them and replace them with, with new information. You know, yeah. Frost said... Um, you know, no tears in the in the writer, no tears in the reader, and I think that's true. Um, mm -hmm. And so, to engage another uh, writer's work in its infancy is a great responsibility, a, a, as well as a, as a great honor. It's, I think it's a hard thing to find first readers. Well, you talk about exploding your metaphors and moving on to new ones. Now, I know that you're working on a, a finishing up a second manuscript and working on a, or three Third. mirror neuron, I believe it was. Yeah. How, how has your has your work changed? How has it changed your concerns, your yeah. exploding metaphors? Well, as I'm doing readings, and I'm reading from the book as well as the, the second manuscript, which is at a publisher right now, I'm hoping to get good news about that, um, and the mm -hmm. third one that I'm just finishing, I'm told that it's three totally different voices. The third mm -hmm. manuscript, Mirror Neuron, is, is really a response to the discovery of a particular brain cell in the 90s called a mirror neuron. And... I've written a scholarly paper on the confluence between that scientific discovery and the humanities, a, a theory about poetics, in which I'm really talking about Shelley, responding to Shelley's essay in defense of poetry. But the more that I work on this paper, the more I realize that I'm uh, at the same time saying yes to some things Eliot had to say about the objective correlative and metaphor and arguing with him and suggesting a an extension of what he had to say. So there's a scholarly component to that, but the artistic component is, I don't know, a series of 60 or 70 poems that, to, that try to deal with the metaphoric resonance of mirror neurons. Mirror as in self, identity, memory, beauty, aesthetics, neuron, intellect, idea, um, how we know what we know, mm. the good and the bad. There's a series of poems in there, for instance, about degenerate art that during the, um, the Holocaust, uh, Kandinsky and, and those folks, and how Hitler was dealing with, with modernist art. So it's a, it's a, it's a somewhat more intellectual um, strain of, of obsession for me. Mm -hmm. um, but ultimately what I'm getting very interested in it in is if you start with an objective correlative, which is essentially a metaphor, but stolen from from artists, the idea of something in a painting that would evoke an emotion. A metaphor evokes certain responses if it comes out of the symbolic system that the, the reader or the audience comes out of. You know, mm -hmm. if we all looked at a, a cup of Starbucks coffee, there's a set of connotative collections around that. You know, some are positive if you love coffee, some are negative if you're against capitalism, whatever. So it, it gives us something symbolic. But how can you move beyond in the poem the original metaphor that you set up and break it and s establish a new one. That's Frost's discovery. Mm -hmm. Frost's tears in, in the writer will make the tears in the reader. Coming to some new knowledge at the end of the poem. And I'm just beginning to, to explore how to do that myself. Well, what kind of new knowledge have you come to? <laughs> <laughs> uh, when you say come to some kind of new no knowledge in the poem, uh -huh. as, as, a, as a poet who has completed three manuscripts, uh -huh. um, have craft-wise, have you come or evolved, come to some kind of new knowledge over the process of, you know, three manuscripts? Um, one of the things that, that I'm learning is that there is a difference between crafting a poem and crafting a book. Okay. And that 
the poems can't just be, in a book, can't just be, as I think in some ways Dancing Bear is, just a collection of poems. There's some linkages, there's some sense of overall arc, but it's really a book in its infancy. It's a first book. Mm -hmm. What I think I'm learning now that I'm moving on um, over the course of books is to to see how do the poems speak to each other? Mm -hmm. How do they cohere? Do they have an arc? Is there a story? Is there an established voice in the early poems that will lead the reader to understand where all of the poems are ultimately trying to go to? Um, it's much harder <laughs> than, than you might think. Okay. You know, trying to achieve one successful poem, then trying to achieve a series of successful poems, then trying to ach achieve a book, something that, that makes a statement in and of itself that moves from the beginning through a middle to mm. an end. Um, mm. That's something I'm trying to give a lot of thought to. So you're no longer kind of writing individual poems, you're actually writing towards a book. No, I'm absolutely writing individual poems, but at the same time metacognitively trying to be aware of what what does that poem, what questions do mm -hmm. that, does that poem raise that aren't answered that require me to write other poems? that would be mm. siblings to that one. Does that make sense? Yeah, it certainly makes sense. It certainly makes sense. Um, as you kind of have moved on as well, and you're now writing fiction even, mm -hmm. um, is there kind of one great piece of advice that you've received or that you often give to uh, writers? I don't know. You have to ask my, my poetry students that. <laughs> um, I, I, I'll quote, loosely quote Kafka. and. Um, I believe it's Kafka. I could really be wrong. Somebody call in, you know, in a couple months and uh, <laughs> correct me. But I think he said something like, go sit down at your kitchen table. Wait long enough and the world will come to you. If you want to write, keep writing. Don't let anything stop you. Keep writing and you will discover in yourself what it is you're trying to find. Well, I think that's great advice. It has been a pleasure talking with you and having you on the Brookdale Writer Series. I know that you'll be reading in... On uh, April 18th, this will probably air after that, but that's cool. Um, and um, we have enjoyed talking to you today. The thank book you. is The Dancing Bear by One Story Press, and thank you for joining Open us. Open Book Press. Open Book Press, I'm sorry. That's okay. And thank you for oh, joining us today. and Colleen Lineberry did the cover. And uh, another colleague did the cover. Yes, Colleen Lineberry. <laughs> Colleen Lineberry. Gorgeous painting. Yes. Um, thank you, and have a good day. <laughs>